you haven't been here the last week or two, we're, um, we're in this Advent season. We have three candles here now lit. Uh, next week we will uh, light the fourth candle. And then when we join back together that following week on the 28th, we will uh, be lighting the Christ candle as we uh, typically would do on, on Christmas Day. But I, I think with this Advent journey, the, the theme has been light. And if um, you weren't with us a couple weeks ago, just to catch you up, and even if you were, just to remind you, we were in a passage in Isaiah in which this prophecy was made. Um, the people are walking in darkness, and they have seen a great light. And if you were here, you weren't here, I was talking about this God. God could have come to his people who are walking in darkness and said, that's what you get. That's what you get for making the decisions that you made. That's what you get when you put your trust in another king other than me. But rather than saying, that's what you get for making your bad decisions, what God says is this, a light is gone. <clears throat> what God says is, let there be light. What God says is, yes, darkness is not the final word, light is. And I'm going to send a new king. I'm going to send a baby. And this king, he will be on the king on the throne forever. His kingdom will have no end. And it will be a kingdom of peace. And we were in Isaiah a couple weeks ago, and then last week, we got to Luke. And so we're in Luke. We'll be in Luke the next couple weeks. Uh, last week, we took a look at a passage of when, when God decides to shine his light into the darkness, to rescue his people out of darkness. What we talked about last week was God decides to use an old barren couple by the name of Zachariah and Elizabeth. And God shows up and says, hey, you're going to have a baby. You're going to have a child. And so we talked about that kind of set the scene up to Jesus about God's prophecy and God's speaking to Mary through the angel uh, Gabriel. So not only is there this promise of a baby boy named John, but there's the promise of this baby who's going to be born and his name is going to be Jesus. His kingdom will have no end. And we talked last week about this. We said, well, if Jesus, if Jesus is this new king and his kingdom will have no end, if Jesus is king, well, then what are we? And what we talked about was this. We're, we're a kingdom of priests. We're a kingdom of priests. What God is wanting to do is he's wanting to bless all the nations of the world, and he's going to do that through us. We talked about this. God, God is not interested in doing a solo act. He never has been. God has always been interested in partnering with humanity to accomplish his mission and purpose in the world. So he gets people like Zachariah and Elizabeth, who are beyond childbearing days, and says, I'm going to use you the same way that he used Abraham and Sarah. And the same way he looks at us saying, we don't really have a whole lot left to give. And God says, you're the perfect candidate for me to accomplish my mission in this world. So if that's you, that's me, well, guess what? Christ is speaking to us saying, hey, join the team. I got, I got something going on here. I've got a mission, and I want you to be a part of it. So we talked about this. We talked about we were a kingdom of priests. We talked about the gave, angel Gabriel showing up to Mary. And so this whole time, too, so we've got Jesus. We're waiting on Jesus to be born. And we're waiting on Zachariah and Elizabeth's boy to be born. We're waiting on John the Baptist to be born. And so this is where you pick up. I'm going to read a passage before we get to the main text, Jimmy. So uh, just listen to this uh, from Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read just a few verses. This is right after Mary says, I'm the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may, may be to me as you've said. And then the angel left her. That's where we left off last week. In verse 39, at that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. So the whole tone of this Advent story in Luke is the whole tone of joy throughout the whole thing. Everyone's excited. Excited about this baby who's going to be born with Zachariah and Elizabeth. Everyone's excited about this baby who's, well, not everyone's excited about the baby who will be born to Mary. Um, uh, everyone's kind of questioning, what in the world, Mary? Uh, you're really not being honest about who the baby this is. Well, I'm just telling you, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So not everyone's nearly as excited about Mary's baby as they are about Zachariah and Elizabeth's. And so when you get to this, and we're going to go ahead and put the passage up on the screen, Jimmy. So this is where after Mary uh, visits Elizabeth, Elizabeth, or Mary finally returns home, and it's time for their baby to be born. Zachariah, Elizabeth's baby to be born. So verse 57 is where we pick up. When it was time for Elizabeth to have a baby, she gave birth to a son. 
Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he's to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened, and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. We're all like, oh, okay, that was quite the passage of scripture there that we read. What I love about this, there's a question in this passage of scripture that I think is a fantastic question. What is this child going to be? What is this child going to be? And, and you know, and I know this, that pretty much any parent, any relative, they ask that question when a child is born. Right? I think we do, don't we? Maybe, maybe it's just me. You ask yourself, you look at this child when the child is born, you think, what? I wonder what my kid's going to be when I grow up. I wonder what this child is going to be. I wonder what this baby is going to become. And it's a question that everyone wants to know, all of the relatives want to know, what in the world is this baby boy John going to be about? Because what we know is God is up to something. God already has a plan and a purpose for Zachariah and Elizabeth, and he absolutely has a plan for John. And I don't know if Zachary and Elizabeth, in this moment, though, know exactly everything that's in store for their son. But what they do know is this. God already has something planned for John. John is in the Lord's hands. He's got a plan. John's destiny is tied up to this prophecy that Zechariah, his dad, is about to proclaim. And what does Zechariah say about his boy? You get down several verses in his prophecy, and he says this. Son, he looks at his boy and he says you are going to be a prophet of the Most High. That's what you're going to be. That's some pretty high, lofty goals for your child. You're going to be a prophet of the Lord, and you are going to prepare the way for the Lord's coming. That's what John's going to be. I don't know about you, but I don't know that, I don't think that I looked at Wesley when he was born, or my daughter Kate, and said, you're going to be a prophet of the Lord. Now, that may be true. That would be pretty cool that my son ended up well, well, they kill prophets in Scripture, so I don't know that I really want that to happen. So, but, but I look at that and I think, okay, well, what is it that I want? I have high hopes for my child. We all have high hopes for our child. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they absolutely have to have these high hopes. And here it is. You're going to be a prophet of the Lord. I look back on my own life and say this. The only thing, the only thing that I felt like my destiny was for was to be a garbage man as a child. Like, all I wanted to do was pull the lever down. And watch the thing just compact and, and just, yeah, just, that's what I wanted to do. Until I got close to a garbage truck and realized my destiny had been shattered. I have no desire to want to be around a garbage truck for the rest of my life. But that, that was it. I mean, those were my high hopes. Be a garbage man. That was all the way up till two years? No, not two years ago. That was all the way, that was all the way up to maybe around eight or nine, somewhere around there. But yeah, I had those high hopes. I don't know what my mom and dad longed for me to be. I have no idea if my mom and dad had plans for me. But I do know this. I know the joy of when my son was born when we had Wesley. And I remember praying for him in the hospital room. I don't remember what my prayer was, but I just remember thinking, God, you got something in store for my boy. And I have no idea what it is yet. But I want to see it happen. 
think. I do. I want to see it happen. I want to know what you have in store for them. And here's Zachariah and Elizabeth. They are filled with joy over the birth of their Lord. And all the relatives, too, are like, they're so excited. It says in Scripture that they all share the joy of Elizabeth and Zachariah. And this is what happens in the story. I love it because everyone wants to know, well, what's the kid's name going to be? Treva, I was going to share a little bit of what, yeah, but I, we wanted to know what this baby's name was going to be, but I decided that would not be good. Uh, but they want to know, who's, who's this baby? What's going to name him? Because everyone expected this baby should be named Zachariah, just after the dad's name. And when you look at it, you find out, that's well, a great name. Zachariah's name means the Lord remembers. The Lord remembers. Right? Name him Zachariah. And then when everyone finds out that, no, the mom speaks up, Elizabeth says, no, his name's going to be John. And they're like, really? John? You're going to name your boy John? Why John? There's no relative that's named John. That's not a family name. You need a name of Zachariah. No, his name is going to be John. Well, and then they're all looking to Zachariah. who can't speak. He can't speak because he didn't believe at first that he would have a child. And they ask, they look to Zachariah and say, Zachariah, write it out. What's the boy's name going to be? And he writes it on the tablet and he says, his name is John. And immediately, his tongue is loose, it says in scripture, he's able to speak and he starts praising God. And when you look at it and you find out what John, anyone know what John's name is? The Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. And what you find out in the story, I love this, this story is couched in the whole narrative of Jesus Christ and the birth of Christ. You've got this narrative happening at the same time with the birth of this baby boy named John, which means the Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. Gracious to Zachariah and Elizabeth, who had, they had shame and disgrace because they couldn't produce children. Not only was the Lord gracious to them, the Lord was gracious to the whole world because God had a plan for John. And guess what John's, his whole destiny was completely intimately linked to the person of Jesus Christ. And let me say this. Our destiny is completely linked to Jesus Christ, whether we realize it or not. If you look in Scripture and you find out that this is how Paul will say in Colossians, all things have been created by Jesus, and they have been created for him. Our destiny is linked to that of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you this too. There's no greater joy in life than serving Jesus Christ. There's no greater joy. Now, why do I say that? I say that from experience, yes, but I say that from Scripture, because you look in the story, too, what they're wondering, Zachariah and Elizabeth are wondering about their boy. What's our child going to be? And here's what Zachariah says. Your boy is going to be a prophet of the God. He's going to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. What is John's mission in life? His mission is simply this. I'm going to point people to Jesus Christ. That's it. You fast forward John the Baptist's life when you go to the book of John, the way John starts in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word, he's, He has the light of life in Him. And this light is going to shine in the darkness, and the darkness will never, never overcome it. And then John goes right into this. He says, there was a man named John. He was not the light. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. And that is John's mission. All John's mission is simply to do this. Hey, you can come and look at me, you can come and hear my preaching all that you want to, but here's my job. He's that way. He's that way. He's that way. And can I tell you, there's no joy, no greater joy than pointing people to Jesus Christ. And I can say it one other way, there's no greater, greater joy in life than being second. There's no greater joy. There's no greater joy in life than being second because I know who's first. And what I find joy in is this. He's that way. He's that way. There he is. You read John 1. It's beautiful. This is a beautiful story. John, if anyone, if anyone could have gotten a Messiah complex, it was John the Baptist. Because crowds were coming to hear him preach. Crowds were coming to the desert. And John the Baptist, he is preaching. And people are coming. He's eating locusts and honey. And they're like, at least come for the show of what he's eating. He's eating locusts and honey. He's preaching the good news. He's preaching the gospel. People are coming. They love John the Baptist. And here is John in chapter 1. Well, everyone's wondering, well, who in the world is John the Baptist? Who is he? The Pharisees want to know. They're like, he's got too many followers. Find out who he is. What's he doing? And they want to know if he's the Messiah. And so Pharisees are sent out. Chief leaders are sent out. And they say to John, they come up to John in the desert. 
John, who are you? Are you the Messiah? And in that moment, John the Baptist could have said, yeah, I am. I'm pretty awesome, all right? My preaching is pretty amazing. I've got the largest church in town. I'm awesome. John the Baptist couldn't have said that, but yeah, he just simply says, no, I'm not. Well, are you a prophet? And here's John, and he's like, no, I'm not even a prophet. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Who are you then, John? I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness. That way. That way. He's over there. The light is over there. I love it because I've been driving in the van with Lindsay, and Kate is in the back seat, and Wesley is in the back seat now. And during Christmas time, my kids love the lights. They love them. And Kate is finally able to say light, kind of. She says, but yeah, it's kind of light, light, semi, anyway, something like that. So she's in the back, and she's so excited as we're driving down the road because anytime we pass a house with Christmas lights, Mommy, Daddy, light, light. And she will, she'll be, I look in the rearview mirror, and she goes, she will finger up. And she points. And my daughter, she never gets it. She's so happy to point to the lights. So excited about it. And it thrills my heart and my soul to think one day when my daughter really gets it. When she knows this, I know where the light is. And I can point people to it. That way, Daddy, see the light? You see Jesus? And I'm going to look at my daughter one day and say, yes. He's beautiful, isn't he? He's beautiful. And honey, I want you to just point, keep pointing people in the right direction. Just keep pointing them that way. Keep pointing them. My daughter and my son, they get it, they're excited. And I can't tell you, there's not going to be any greater joy that I have as a father than when my son and my daughter say, my life is Jesus. My life is in his hands. There's not going to be any greater joy than I have as a parent when my son says to me, Dad, Jesus Christ saved me. When Kate says the same thing, I, I just, I long for that day. I want my son, I don't know what I want my son to be. I look at my son's and I don't want, I have no idea what Wesley does his first going to be. Yes, right now he wants to be Batman, so. <laughs> That way, yeah. Uh, he, want, he wants to be Batman. He wants to be Batman right now. I'm like, son, yeah, that's not going to work out so well. Um, but I, but I want, I don't, it doesn't matter what my son and my daughter do to make a living. It doesn't matter who writes the paycheck. It doesn't matter what their profession is so that they have income to provide for their families. It's all nice and well when the things come together. But guess what I want to know? What I hope, what I hope in the depth of my heart is this that Wesley and Kate are servants of Jesus Christ. Because I'm absolutely convinced that they will have no greater joy in life than serving Jesus Christ. And I won't have any greater joy as a parent than knowing my children are serving Jesus Christ. That's it. That's what Zachariah and Elizabeth wanted for the movie. Oh, he's going to be a prophet of God. Hmm. He's going to point people to Jesus Christ. And John, here it is. So John's standing here talking to his disciples, his followers. And you got this great story in John chapter 1 where Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, walks up and another disciple is talking to, Jesus, or talking to John. They're having this great conversation. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks up. And he walks right by. And John the Baptist says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the Son of the Lord. It says this in John 1, and Andrew and the other disciple left John and followed Jesus. And so here's John thinking, that was a lot of hard work that I had. You're just going to leave me that easily to follow Jesus? You're going to come hear me, you're going to come follow me, and now you're going to just follow Jesus. That's not what John's response is. I'm pretty sure that John, I know that this is poetic license here, I'm pretty sure I see a smile on John's face to say, it's my pleasure. John's like the best Chick-fil-A worker ever. <laughs> best Chick-fil-A worker ever. You know, I mean, he's just like, it is, it is my pleasure. He's that way. <laughs> Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Go gaze upon him. Go worship him. Go serve him. Go follow him. Because you will find no greater joy than being a servant of Jesus Christ. It is my pleasure to point it in. It's my pleasure. 
it fills my heart with so much joy to point people to Jesus Christ. I absolutely believe that John the Baptist was convinced of that. And I'm absolutely convinced that in my own heart, my own life, and I'm convinced of it for you as well, we will find no greater joy in life than being second, than sending people and pointing people to the person of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You'll find no greater joy than pointing people to the child of the Christmas season saying, oh, this baby boy is different than any other baby boy that's ever been born. There's no greater joy than many people to Jesus Christ. We're going to sing joy to the world again this morning. And as I was thinking about this message, I Christ was reminding me all week about the joy of my salvation. Let me rephrase that. The joy of God's salvation in saving me and experiencing that. And there's a passage of scripture that was coming to my mind. That I was thinking about us during the Christmas season sometimes, the video was pointing to this, but we get so we get so busy in the Christmas season that we do, we, for, we forget, yes, we know that this is really the most important, the nativity scene, the, the birth of Christ is the most important thing. But we get so busy with everything else that we realize this just kind of is in the shadow, it's in the distance. And it's one of these things that say, well, let's, let's push this to the front. Just push it to the front for a moment and say, yes, restore to me the joy of my salvation, of God's salvation. And there's this passage of scripture where David, King David, he gets caught in his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. So he gets, you know, he's guilty of adultery, he's guilty of murder. I mean, King David, the king of all kings in the Old Testament, the king after God's own heart. And he gets caught in sin. It trips him up and he stumbles. And then David, he thinks he gets away with it, but then David gets, uh, gets confronted by the prophet Nathan. And God sends Nathan to him and says, hey, oh David, you think you've gotten away with this sin, but the Lord knows. The Lord's seen it. And David, what I love about David's prayer, it's absolutely beautiful. David, he just he humbles himself in a moment. He says, oh God, have mercy on me. Oh God, be gracious to me. Be merciful to me. And he gets to this end of this prayer and he says, Oh, God, create in me a clean heart. <coughs> Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And I've thought about this, and as I pray for you as a church, sometimes I, I pray for a lot of us. It's a prayer for me, it's a prayer for you, is this, God... Would you restore to the people of Old Hickory Church in Nazarene the joy of your salvation? Would you restore it? I see joy in this church. Don't get me wrong. It's not that you guys aren't joyous or joyful. It's probably more of a prayer for me. And I'm thinking, well, maybe if I'm feeling it, a lot of the people here feel it. <laughs> and sometimes we just forget the joy of knowing God's salvation. And so if that's you this morning, our time of prayer, and as we sing joy to the world again, my prayer is simply, oh God, fill our hearts with joy again this morning. Fill our hearts with joy so that the joy overflows, so that it is our pleasure to keep pointing people to Jesus Christ. Because we find it every moment of every day, and we say, I've got another opportunity to point someone to Jesus Christ. And I can't find any great joy in doing that. But God, I need you to restore the joy. I need to restore the joy of your salvation that will give me. Because I'm a little dry. Joy is maybe not, it's not what I'm feeling right now. And if that's you, I'm just simply asking that prayer. I'm saying, oh God, restore that joy in us. And maybe this morning you say you're here, you're like, no, Tony, I'm about as joyful as I could possibly be. <laughs> and come and talk to me. I need to talk to somebody like that, all right? So come up afterwards and tell me that no. But if that's you, just say this. Who is it that God's putting on your heart and life in this day? Who's he asking you to, to point in the direction? Who's he putting in your life to say, oh, I've got this person in mind. Point them to me. Point them to the light. Point them that way. It's my pleasure, Lord. It's my pleasure, whatever you want. I don't know what the Lord wants to do, but I know this. <laughs> there is joy for the whole world. Because Jesus Christ is coming. There's joy. There's joy in serving Jesus Christ.
You can find it trying to serve someone else or something else. You will not find it there. You find it in serving him. You find it there. My mom has it up on, I've shared this before, my mom has a verse of scripture. I have no great, there's no greater joy. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. Third John 4. He's a Patricia, I believe Patricia's on too on their wall. And it's not just for children, and this is the thing, John's prayer, it's not just for his biological children. John has that prayer for all believers. Because we're all children of God. That God finds no greater joy to than hearing us walking in truth. So I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and uh, let's just spend a couple moments of prayer. And my hope is this, my main prayer is God, fill our hearts with joy once more and we'll stand together here in just a moment uh, to worship as we sing the Lord. Let's pray together.